Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 656. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. It's April 7th, 2021. All right, welcome to another show of Anglican Unscripted post Easter. Now, one of us, not me, is clergy, and uh, the Easter season, Lenten season, is a busy time for George. How many services have you done in the last week or two, George? Well, since Monday Thursday, I've had 16 services in person or online, including funerals, and now that Easter week is over, wow. backed up funerals were done. And um, except for morning prayer in Compline, which we only do online, everything that we do in person has its online counterpart. But they have to be filmed separately because our big, ch big church... Uh, is just absolutely dreadful. We have very large uh, windows in the back of the altar, which uh, backlights everybody in front of it. So it's it's all but useless. Uh, so we so we go to the uh, chapel to film uh, all the different services, and and I try to do different, uh, and I have a different sermon online versus a sermon in person. Um, and so I'm talked out. <laughs> I have nothing both. intelligent to say, Kevin, for at least a month. Or two. I know. I'm sorry. We're both brain dead. I mean, I, for me, Lent is something I, I really try to experience and, and uh, uh, really culminates with the Tenebrae service. Uh, Easter is a wonderful festive time for uh, the Coulsons. We raised our kids to, to love that Easter and that, that new morning-ish. Uh, and times have really changed. I just got a, a press release that says technology overtakes print for believers in America for the first time ever. More people are getting their resources for church online in video form, and they're getting um, more of their scripture reading, uh, including uh, the Bible, the Quran, and everything else online. They're not buying Bibles, they're buying apps. And that's a, a complete change from five years ago. And COVID really kind of rushed this in where George has to sit down and duplicate everything he's doing online. Now, uh, well, whoever gets the second service usually gets the better one because the first service I make all the mistakes <laughs> and I re refine my dumb jokes. And uh, Susan says, you can't say that in public. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's what clergy wives are for. You can't say that. No, don't say that. Well, All right. You know, so there's always my, my favorite. The, my favorite one that Susan says I can't say in public was why wasn't Jesus born in Okeechobee? Yeah. Why not? Why? Yeah. Because they couldn't find a virgin and three wise men. <laughs> George. <laughs> so evidently that's that's something that you can't say when the children are seated there. No, you can't. You can say that on Unscripted, but you can't say it at church, please. Oh, my Lord. So let's move on to the news before we get too far. Uh, it's a new season. We're in Easter. That means you need to like the program because that tells the uh, uh, artificial intelligence at Google and Facebook and everywhere else, YouTube, that they need to promote this. That it's a like program that's free advertising for us. Uh, share this with friend and foe comment in the comment section we love reading all your comments last episode was an amazing amount of comments if you have not subscribed yet please subscribe and there is a an audio only uh version of this program we don't re-record it for audio it's not anything but a duplicate but we have a podcast if you go to the show notes at youtube you can click on the link and sign up for the podcast all right so we have about three or four big stories we're going to talk about First, Bishop Love, who resigned from the House of Bishops at the Episcopal Church uh, last week, has joined the ACNA under Bishop Julian Dobbs. Wow. I, you know, we kind of saw it coming. He announced it was going to happen. It's happened. And for me, this is good news because, to my knowledge, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here, he is the only person who understands what's happening with critical race theory and woke in the church. In fact, he used his uh, I'm out of here sermon to uh, try and wake up the church about woke. Uh, I don't know of any other Episcopal bishop and uh, or ACNA bishop who's spoken out against woke yet, George. 
No, there's uh, race is the third rail in Anglican, uh, in American Anglicanism, uh, be it the Episcopal Church, the ACNA, and that um, you get some people uh, who are. In other words, we've we've had people uh, in the ACNA get all bent out of shape about white Christian nationalism. Now, nobody has actually defined that for me. But now that phrase is used to describe the people who assaulted the Capitol on January 6th, who are the, uh, the, uh, the uh, unreconstructed Trump supporters. And you have uh, the woke element of the ACNA going off on this evil of white Christian nationalism. I have no clue what that means. It means whatever you, whoever you wish to denigrate. If you uh, want your child to say the Pledge of Allegiance in in public school, you're a white Christian nationalist. Uh, if you well, want to live in a theocracy under Rush Dooney, you're a white Christian nationalist. I mean, so it it means nothing. But we're now we've the ACNA does have its section of uh, of uh, name callers who uh, use uh, who spew out this uh, ideology of hatred, ideology of racism. Uh, who are not Christians, frankly. And one of the things that Bishop Love brings to the ACNA is integrity. He uh, is a man of great integrity, but he also has been able to name and identify the enemy. The question is, will the ACNA kick Bishop Love out the way the Episcopal Church kicked Bishop uh, Love out? I doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> I think he, he will be loved and appreciated and, and hopefully listened to on, on critical race theory. Uh, I want to bring... But, you know, but, but Kevin, I mean, the, the ACNA has allowed these networks to form without any adult supervision and allowed them to just spew these vile, vile things that are contrary to clear Christian doctrine. Uh, even N.T. Wright, who is the squareliest good thinker on the planet Scorlius has come out against CRT but uh, being right of course he refuses to back anybody but uh, NT right yes but uh, <laughs> but you, you know you if you're silent in the face of this stuff and allow it to go on under the mantle of the ACNA uh, I don't think you're doing your job no, I, I think it's it's time for uh, the ACNA and all Christian organizations to put out a policy statement on critical race theory. Um, I want to bring, draw to attention one of our viewers, Drew Collins. Uh, he's out of Charleston, South Carolina, I think, somewhere. Goose, uh, Goose Creek, I think, is the... Goose Creek. Uh, posted a picture on his uh That's Facebook probably page. the same size as Lacanto. I mean. <laughs> right there, yes. Do Who they knows? have a Wendy's? We do. We just got one. <laughs> you got a Wendy's already. We don't have a yes. Wendy's here in yes. Webster. Um, posted a picture on his Facebook page of a book, and uh, it's The Prayer of a Weary Black Woman. woman. And uh, the first paragraph, I don't know what chapter it is, uh, she, it says, Dear God, please help me to hate white people, or at least to want to hate them, at least, comma, I want to stop caring about them individually and collectively. I want to stop caring about their misguided, racist souls, to stop believing them uh, that they can be better and that uh, they could ever stop being racist. This comes from Dr. Walker Barnes, who's the Associate uh, Professor of Practical Theology at McAfee School of Theology at Mercer University. And I think I think Mercer's Baptist. You would think she's Nation of Islam. <laughs> yes, uh, Elijah Muhammad, uh, uh, oh. Louis. Fer this is Louis Farrakhan. Crap. This this is Louis. Now, here, let's change some words around, and see how offended you are. Dear God, please help me to hate black people, or at least want to hate them. Could you imagine the outcry if we changed the the color of the skin here? if we added uh, more pigma pigmentation to that statement. the This person would be canceled. She would never write a book again. And if she could get a job at Walmart, we would be surprised. But because yeah. she's attacking a, a, uh, a, a race that is unpopular right now, mine, uh, she's going to get away with this. 
75 years ago, we saw this in some German Christian churches, but changed the word white for Jew. Yeah. Lord, help me hate the Jew, the insidious Jew. This and that that is unreconstructed evil and satanic. And this is a professor at a Baptist seminary uh, who's publishing this. She's not saying this to her friends over a cup of coffee, uh, complaining about somebody. She's putting this out for the world. Just as Ibrahim Kendi, who's the sort of high priest of critical race theory, the man of the hour, the, the guy that they pay $10,000 an hour corporations to come tell them how bad it is uh, not being him. He, he, he says, you know, that Christianity is a lie because it allows for uh, uh, forgiveness and the atonement. Now, so those who have gone down the CRT line are denying that you can be saved, you can, that your sins can be forgiven, that Christ died an atoning death for you. And yes, under Hitler, the trains ran on time and there's no unemployment. There were also three million dead Jews. Six million. Uh, yes, six million dead Jews. <laughs> That's right. Uh, under CRT, yes, it makes you feel good that you're speaking up for the oppressed. But at the same time, the odor of the gas chamber lingers around CRT in a way that is, this is Pol Pot second time around. This is yeah. the Tootsies and the this Hutus is, this another is, time around. This is how you start a genocide, to take one race or one tribe of people and just atone as much hate and disgust towards them as you can. And to let the people that you want to hate this group know that they aren't forgivable. And we saw this in Rwanda. Isn't this the anniversary? Yesterday? Yesterday was the 27th. Uh, April 6, 1994 mm -hmm. was the start of the 100 days in Rwanda. It saw almost a million people killed. I don't know the exact number. I don't know if it'll ever be known. No, it Hundreds be known. of thousands. Because back then there was just no communication between towns and communities within Rwanda. Uh, they didn't know there was a problem until they just, you know, started seeing bodies. Why is this village well, destroyed? You know, why are people chopped and hacked up? What's going on here? Well, the, the Rwanda 94 was state-sponsored genocide. Mm -hmm. The MNRD government, which was the government in power, the president was killed by a surface-to-air missile, which is not something that you or I have, not, the gun nuts don't have. No. One of the things, the first, now see if this rings any bells. The first thing they did was confiscate all the guns in Rwanda. Then they imposed a nationwide lockdown and curfew. Then they put in roadblocks. Then they cut the telephone wires. Then they uh, ref, uh, uh, started a campaign of disinformation on the radio, the only things that were working. And then they started to kill people. And they would go from town to town, village to village. The uh, Interwara, the, uh, I think it's Interwara, the, the Hutu killing groups and local sympathizers, the Karens of Rwanda would point out the Tutsis. And you or I couldn't tell the difference between a Hutu and a Tutsi because it's there's some stereotypes that sure. Tutsis are taller, Hutus are shorter, but it's, it's nonsense. You could find examples that contradict that. Mm -hmm. But with the Karen supporting them, hundred you know, people would be murdered. And the church, there were Anglican bishops involved in the murder, Catholic bishops, seventh no church was unscathed, the Muslims. They they found went, bodies it, and bodies and bodies in churches. People went to the church for refuge. Nobody will kill me in a church. Wrong. And where it started was through the big lie, through the government uh, taking away your means of your liberties, your freedoms, your, build, your right to own a gun. One of the things that always gets me is uh, how the gun laws in the United States have benefited the minority, minority community from the very beginning. In, uh, in the Dred Scott decision, which was the pre-Civil War decision that said basically slaves were not human beings. Mm -hmm. uh, Roger Taney, the uh, Supreme Court Chief Justice, who was a Southerner, he was from Maryland, but he was a he, he was a pro-slavery, said, you know, if we make if we allow black people to have the protections of the U.S. Constitution as citizens, then they then they'll carry guns, Good. and they'll be able to defend <laughs> themselves. And the and you know the Civil Rights Movement mm -hmm. uh, in the '60s and in the 
black communities in the 20s and 30s protected themselves from the Klan because they could go own a gun. And now uh, we, we see this, uh, you know, gun control. That's what the first things the Nazis did, confiscate all guns. The first thing the, the, uh, and the, the, the Hutus did in the genocide of Rwanda. Now, I'm not saying we're going to have a genocide within the year, far from it. Um, but there are a lot of eerie parallels, I believe. And there, there is, because what we're having now is we're shaming one pig, pigmentation of skin, one race. If you are white, you're, you're, being, you're being shamed. And you can't complain for, for us shaming your white skin. Because if you're complaining, that's because you have white privilege. You don't understand all the privilege you have, and you should be shamed by the rest of the world. And, you know, I can't tell you that this is not going to turn out well unless we, we put a stop to it, especially in the church. Especially in the church. You know, That's why I think Bishop Love is really a beacon of hope yeah. for so many people, because he had, he had the courage to speak to what is the real, the real issue in this country is not global warming or mosquito nets or immigration. The real Im issue in this country is sin and hatred. And wherever it pops up, it needs to be confronted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. And for those church leaders who were too cowardly to speak because they wouldn't appear to be PC uh, or attractive to the 20 somethings, uh, don't forget, folks, that the Nazi Party's greatest strength was in the universities. The Utes. Yeah. No, the, the Hitler Utes. Now, you know, we, we're talking about, I, I fully acknowledge that 30, maybe 35% of people out there in the world, in the churches, in clergy, in bishops, in archbishop roles, are just ignorant. They don't know, about, you know, the wholeness of what critical race theory is. They know right now we're having race issues in the world and that there's a lot of fighting going along, a lot of struggle going on. But I think a lot, you know, there's a, a good one third of people are just ignorant. Now, I have some of these people in my church who they work full time, they go home, they raise their family, they don't pay attention to the politics that, and, and what's going on in the world as much as George and I do. And I, I don't fault them for not knowing what critical race theory is. I do fault leaders in the church for not knowing it. It's time really to understand that this is going to be the immediate future, uh, certainly within America, which has swelled this you know, hook, line, and sinker, um, but it's going to happen more and more in Europe, certainly Canada. And once it's, it, it, it takes full hold, being a white person, you're going to have trouble getting a job uh, because it comes with instant... Uh, Boy, they did that in, in Nazi Germany, didn't they? The Jews couldn't get jobs. There was a night they went around and broke all the windows of the Jewish businesses. Oh, and we're seeing that now here. Ah, oh. crystal, crystal knocked. Uh, we're yeah. seeing we're seeing it in Portland. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things. Uh, well, I don't want to depress people too much. Not, yeah, it's Easter. But, yeah. but the but the issue really is evil. Mm -hmm. And the blindness to most people. I mean, if if you're like me, you have a happy life. You have lovely family, children. You have a great church, and you go home at the end of a long day and watch the Home and Garden Channel, and that's it. You're not involved in Portland or. And occasionally, you'll see something on the Facebook where someone will message you. Can you believe that Share is now an unperson? Share of all people is politically incorrect. I mean, Sonny Bono, yes, but yes, share. Yes, of course, not share. Well, I saw Bruce Jenner is, going, want, is considering running for uh, California governor. We're, that's yeah, cool. But he's a, re oh, he's <laughs> yeah, a he's Republican. A re oh. I mean, what a world we're living in. <laughs> no, uh, hold on. When Jesse Ventura became the governor of, of uh, Minnesota, I'm like, how could you top that? So, all right. With Arnold Schwarzenegger, <laughs> Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> governor. 
<laughs> the oh, competition well, for governorships. Yeah. Well, Sylvester Stallone may stand for election here in Florida. He lives in Miami Beach, so that's we, right. We'll yes, see. All right. All right. Let's move on. Uh, Follow-ups to Jonathan Fletcher uh, report that came out. Uh, a lot of people are surprised that nobody's gotten fired yet. Nobody's quit yet. Nobody's lost their job. There's not any talk in the Church of England at the bishop level or archbishop level about this. It's kind of, yeah, it was something happened a long time ago. Here's your report. Let's move on. We're, we're, we're moving on. Jonathan, who? And you and I were discussing the pre-show, you know, who's going to lose their jobs in this? And my preposition is nobody's going to lose their job because the scandal goes too high. And if you start uh, making people quit, sooner or later they're going to point their fingers at you and you'll have to quit. So I say this report just gets filed. And um, you know, if you got hurt, too bad. Sorry. Kevin, we're, every year we seem to get less Christmas cards from England. Um, yes. <laughs> You know, Justin Welby no longer writes and tells us how he and the wife are doing. And no, I think uh, I hear what you're saying. I'm afraid what you say might be true, but there are some signs that not all is as stitched up as some would like. Uh, William Taylor is the rector of uh, St. Helen's Bishopgate, which is one of the mega powerhouse churches in the conservative evangelical movement. It's wealthy, it's well attended, it's influential, uh, its curates go on to serve in many of the great churches in the Church of England. Um, William Taylor is one of the leaders of the conservative evangelical movement who was not named by name in the report but was referred to obliquely. And when the uh, four auditors or four people who put together the report issued their independent statement from the report they essentially called on taylor and the people like taylor to step back and step down taylor responded on palm sunday with a, an address to his congregation which was on the parish live stream and where he denounced the uh the report from the uh, four uh, people as a political hit job this was just pure politics and he was quite angry and vociferous and very unattractive in how he was presenting himself was that I am too important to be touched. You can't have anything to do with me. Well, this report caused a bit of a, this, this series of announcements caused an uproar and they, the parish quickly took down the video, but we have a copy of it, which we put on Anglican Inc and some responses to taylor were written by victims and then taylor wrote a an apology where he climbed down a bit uh but taylor is starting to bleed and the sharks are in the water now you're right kevin the sharks are not the bishops they're not the institution of the church of england um some of the things that are buried deep in this report is that uh one of the leaders at uh St. Helens Bishop Gate is a trustee of some charitable institution, and it was recommended that he be removed for not complying with proper trust regulations. The fellow is a trustee of a number of entities, including in the Diocese of London, and Julian Mann, who wrote, who's an independent journalist who publishes sometimes in Anglican Inc., is uh, asking the Diocese of London, well, what do you think about the fact that he's been asked to step down from this charity yet he's a trustee of some of your charities. Now, this is a fair and honest question. It's a great question, but the, uh, the facade is not gonna hold too much longer and people are gonna start going down. And one of, the, one of the comments on our last show when we talked about this was, yes, they're gonna fire the janitor. Um, that'll be the token. And it may, that may be, but there's such a stink. Well, for instance, we talked about how last last show we talked about how the outside auditor appointed by Emmanuel Church Wimbledon to look at their things really wasn't an outsider. And the day after our broadcast, he published an open letter resigning as the auditor um, 
to spend more time with his family. You know, that's well, what he, he cited funny. the concerns we cited and said, you know, I, I, in this phase of my life, shouldn't be auditing in church, yes. And in another le, uh, letter written by some of the victims, they cite a, uh, an influential Anglican uh, website that has been publishing this stuff. And I think we're the only ones doing it uh, consistently. Uh, other people are putting up things here and there, but um, for some reason, we we have been given the ball to carry forward on this issue. Um, and I don't know why the English press is more interested in this, this uh, whole scandal. As we've discussed before, the Church of England has no more influence in British society. Uh, if the BBC doesn't call the Archbishop of Canterbury and ask his opinion on something weekly, there's your problem, you know. And what, maybe it's an old story, but yeah. see, hypocrisy sold newspapers, and you've got wonderful hypocrisy here. Yeah. Yeah, but they're they're more interested in uh, well, the, the the government of Boris Johnson does a better job of public hypocrisy than. Uh, that's unkind. I shouldn't no, say that. Come on. Not not English. I don't have a right to say that. <laughs> Okay, yeah. the Biden administration. I'm an American. I can say this. You can uh, talk. Oh my god! Does gosh. a better job with public hypocrisy <laughs> than conservative evangelical. So it's a bigger story. I I yeah. grant you that. Well, I want to do a hypocrisy story of the week here. Major League League Baseball uh, decided that the new uh, voter rules laws in Georgia were too cumbersome and racist. Therefore, we're going to pull the All Star game which is going to be played in Georgia and move it somewhere else less racist. Um, and so Major League Baseball, at least the commissioner or whoever, the head said, we're out of, we're out of Georgia. We're going to find some place uh, that's got better laws for voters. So they dump it in Colorado, which has more restrictive absentee ballot laws, more restrictive ID laws, less minority population, much less minority-run businesses. You're taking the money from the minorities in Georgia, and you're giving Atlanta, it to the... Atlanta is a majority black city. Yeah, and you're dropping it in Colorado where all the whites are going to just benefit from your, your very woke, very virtual signal decision, major league baseball. Hypocrisy story of the week. We should we could do that every week, George. Um, we didn't get to talk about this because it happened uh, over our oh. Easter... Break. Kevin, yeah. don't forget to main, main that the day before they made the announcement, Major League Baseball signed a major deal with China. China, yeah. So, you know, it's okay to uh, do business and take the Chinese uh, Communist Party's money, but you don't want to uh, help some poor vendor in Atlanta. Who enslave uh, Muslims and persecute Christians even... Even in, you know, in, in public now. It's no longer hidden. It, you know, we have public video of it, and nobody cares because there's so much money. Ask Tesla; they're making tons of money. Because well, the the, th the th you know the thing that is so stupid for Major League Baseball is that is basically saying you have to be a Democrat now to be a baseball fan. And you know, the la I went to the last Phillies preseason game before they shut everything down last uh -huh. year, and. I got to tell you, Kevin, 15,000 people in the stands, 14,000, I think, were men in undershirts with baseball hats. Yes. Living hardly, the dream. Hardly, hardly, I didn't see any transgendered, woke people with purple no. hair and no. nose piercings. Uh, I saw, you know, blue collar people uh, who had an afternoon off at a baseball game with their kids. Yeah. Huh. And basically, to stick your finger in the eye of those people, to appease the professional complainers, it's not too bright. No, it's not. Uh, well, look at the look at the Masters. I mean, the Masters was under the same pressure mm. as Major League Baseball to cancel their uh, Augusta. Their, the Masters, yeah. Augusta National, which is happening mm. this week, yeah. which every good Episcopal priest is watching avidly, and they basically said, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, fine, <laughs> screw you, we're going to go ahead." <laughs> and and what has happened to the Masters? Major. Uh, ratings no, uh, absolutely. they're doing a great job they're yeah. making uh, and uh, sooner or later major league sports are going to realize this your audience your spectators want you to take no opinion on anything 
All they want you to do is provide entertaining sports where at the end of the day, there's victory and there's loss. You know, you don't care if your team lost because you got to watch the greatest game. You don't care that your team won because you got to watch a great team. So at the end of the day, I hope well, Major Kevin, League understands that. We're at a place in our national conversation where Charles Barkley is the <laughs> soul Jeez. of reason and balance and intellect. Charles Barkley was on CBS the other day, and he was uh, just tearing into the woke crowd saying, look, white people and black people like each other. The vast, overwhelming majority, they're happy to live together. They're happy to work together. It's the political class that has a stake in dividing them. It's not the rich people's neighborhoods get burned down in riots. It's not the rich people's stores get, get ransacked when we have a, a riot. It's, it's the people who, whom they're winding up. Char and Charles, so, and Charles Barkley was absolutely right. And I guess I'm now waiting for Billy Idol to uh, make a statement about race relations. I mean, come on now. Well, Cher tried. <laughs> and look uh, what it got her. And look, look what Cher's got. half American Indian, Native yeah. American. And <laughs> now ahead. she's a non-person for making a reasonable statement about race. Incredible. Well, All right. You wrote a story last week, or you posted a story on Anglican Inc. Um, that we never got to talk about because of the Easter break, Good Friday Easter break. Canterbury seeks an agreement to disagree over gay marriage within the Anglican world, basically make, making Anglican communion an ecumenical type uh, communion. And I thought, you know, we, we should probably mention that. And if you, you guys haven't read the article, go to Anglican.inc. It's the uh, the lead article, the most read article in the last couple weeks. Um, it's, it's, it's a big story because he's still trying to hold the team together, George, trying to get that band to, to, to play the same music. And I don't think it's going to work. Well, for people like me who remember Ed Browning, the former presiding bishop of the sure. Episcopal Church before Frank Griswold, Ed Browning had a mantra, no outcasts. Everybody is welcome in the Episcopal Church. Now, what did that really mean in practice? It meant that people who held traditional viewpoints were unwelcome because they were not welcoming of other viewpoints. And so, hence, over the course of time, the logical outcome with Catherine Jeffrey Shorey, who was solely responsible for the formation of the ACNA. Advanced to the present, Justin Welby, first off, he gave this interview to the socialist newspaper La Repubblica, and he touched upon a number of issues. He talked about the Harry and Meghan thing, where he finally, for the first time, told an Italian newspaper, no, he didn't marry them early on. If he had, it would have been illegal because he signed the marriage certificate three days later at Windsor Castle, at St. George's Chapel, Windsor. Just, and, and we had these, we had the, the Welby files commenting, well, he was just being pastoral and not betraying any confidences. Six okay. weeks of news that he could have answered long ago. He could have answered in three days. He could have answered immediately. And he waits till he talks to a left-wing Italian newspaper. La Repubblica, by the way, is the one that publishes these extracts from the Pope uh, that uh, cause all these scandals from time all, to time. Because all, all the good quotes. <laughs> all, because the editor doesn't take notes. He just writes from memory. Well, well, Justin Welby talked about uh, that the La Repubblica said, well, you, why really haven't you gotten on board the gay bandwagon Anglicans. I mean, you really need to, to get with the times. And Justin Welby said, well, I personally can't answer that because I don't want to prejudice the outcome of the living and love and faith process, which is where the Church of England is trying to find a way to split the difference between sexual activity outside of marriage as a sin or it's just wonderful and go to that and then he went on to say that you know, his hope is that we can find a way to love each other and support and encourage each other even though we don't agree on the issues that he really thinks are secondary to the major issues so justin welby is singing the song of 20 years ago in the episcopal church and john richard newhouse uh 
the the late editor of First Things, very prominent Catholic thinker in the United States, once said that when orthodoxy is optional, it will soon become illegal. We saw that in the Episcopal Church. And Welby is trying to make orthodoxy optional. And what he's doing is you need to understand this, that the, this he's shifting the dynamic so that being pro-gay is pre allowable and being pro-traditional is tolerated. Whereas today, being traditional is the core and they tolerate the pro-gay side. You, you see that the, no, they're basically don't. slipping things around and it, it's, it's for instance why Welby uh, doesn't say word one about violations of Lambeth 110 uh, committed by the American, the Scottish, the uh, Brazilian, Canadian, Canadian churches. Yeah. But uh, when the Nigerians blot their copybook on Lambeth one for them. So Welby, and the, the other thing that to be, to be viewed as an honest broker, to be able to find a way where everybody basically agrees to love each other and respect each other, you have to come into the equation as an honest broker. Justin Welby had that five, six years ago. It's, oh, it's now totally gone. Uh, he is not, uh, in the international scene, maybe England is different, but in the international scene, he is personally disliked but by a number of primates who've told us this. Um, they're, you know, so, well, I don't want to break confidence. No, 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 like yeah, yeah, no, no. He's, he's, like kinda, the he's the Jimmy Carter of Anglicanism, you know. Uh, he's trying to do Oof. a good job. He's got the right heart, but he's just not doing the right job by making the hard decisions because a hard decision here would mean, well, the, the church would split and I'd have to take sides. Well, the Catholics would just fight. Well, I don't want to criticize the Catholics here. You know, it's just like, <laughs> okay, George. <laughs> you know, and for our, for our English viewers, if you want an equivalent, call him the Harold Wilson of the Anglican Church or the Perfect Jimmy example. Carter of the Jimmy American Church. Yeah. Yes. Just somebody who just isn't up to the job. Hmm. Ah, what a great note to end on. Let me go check my notes, see if we got anything else we to talk about. Uh, no, Indian corruption, you, you, too short a topic for our show here. Um, no, we got everything. Once again, we're going to close out here. Like the program now that you got through it. Yeah, it was an okay program. Share it if you're not shared it. Comment if you're not commented. If you had not subscribed yet, what is taking you so long? I ask myself. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching episode 656 of Anglican Unscripted. See, it helps when you write that number down. It's a big number. You know, big number. <laughs> <laughs>